Uh-oh. What are they talking you about? Your red hair. Nothing. Uh, welcome to those that have joined us uh, from home this evening. Uh, this is a work session of the Pocosin City Council on September the 26th. And we're here to talk about uh, the colonial behavioral health. Uh, Mr. David Coe is there, is here to uh, talk us through. We always appreciate that. It's actually very fitting for tonight, Council, because uh, as we know, we, we did have uh, a, res a resignation from that board, and we are going to make an appointment tonight. So it's actually uh, good timing, David, that, uh, that you come and talk to us. And uh, without really further ado, I'll just... Let you tell us what you need to tell us. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> okay, now it is. Um, I don't think we've ever, uh, at Colonial, ever come and made a presentation like this to City Council, at least not in my memory, and I've been at Colonial about 12 years. So, let me first say I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, to make this presentation. And as you looked at the packets that uh, we brought down last week that have all the brochures and the annual reports and those, you'll find all honesty, I struggled a little bit about what to bring in tonight to really speak on because we don't have time to So we're going to focus a little bit on some uh, projects that, that we're involved with, but certainly if we're not presenting and we don't touch on topics that are of interest to you, uh, feel free to request more information or have us come back. We'd be happy to do that at, at any time. So having said that, uh, we'll just uh, head directly into our presentation. So, Colonial has been around now for 45 years. Um, we uh, started out with a uh, name that was that would, the letterhead would have been about three lines up quite a bit to colonial behavioral health over the years and Pocosin joined us um, and you, you'll find us in chapter 37 of the state code but we were created under chapter 10 uh, did mention our board of directors we do have a 15 member board of which Pocosin has uh, two representatives one of which is, uh, is vacant at this point, so, okay. We'll be looking forward to, uh, to, to that appointment tonight. For the last uh, four, five years, well, four years, uh, we have averaged about 180 residents a year. We were up over 200 residents uh, early in this time, and over the last couple of years, those numbers have dropped a bit. Uh, much related to the construction that was taking place on Route 17. Uh, the entrance to our building was actually closed off, and to get to us, you would have to wind back through the neighborhood to come, in, come in a side entrance. And uh, there's a number of times we had our uh, phone lines cut, and that's just a natural part of the construction, uh, but we're, we fully expect that is turning around because finally traffic is clear and running smoothly on 17 on that end so but of those that have come and th these percentages haven't changed a lot over over the last few years is uh, about three three-fifths or about 60 percent are coming to us for mental health services and that would include children adults and geriatric uh, populations again about one in 20 uh, or those in developmental services uh, the term for this used to be uh, mental retardation that term is now intellectual disabilities, which would include uh, what we call ID and then uh, autism spectrum disorder and, and other services as well. About a quarter of our population is substance use and then emergency services, roughly one in 10 uh, or one in 11 would be uh, coming to us for in some sort of a mental health crisis. Um, of that population, breaking that down a little further, uh, you'll find about 18% of that number over the years has been uh, children, uh, birth to 17. Uh, vast majority of the population has been adult. And then geriatric, our geriatric population, even though this is disproportionate to the number of seniors we have living in our communities, it has a lot to do with for, uh, for a number of years, 
uh, we did not have a psychiatrist employed that was comfortable seeing, uh, seeing seniors. Uh, you know, we, we think that psychiatrists are able to see everybody, but there are those who specialize and have training in, in geriatrics versus children versus adults, and uh, just as a, uh, a podiatrist would intend to work in cardiology, uh, psychiatrists have the same sort of thing working with uh, particularly age populations. Uh, but we do have a, a nurse practitioner who is comfortable working with um, geriatrics now. So we're, we're happy about that. And you'll see our breakdown between male and female. N not, not, un not unusual. Uh, a picture of our York Pocosin office I will be sharing later. Um, that building is full. Uh, and pretty much overflowing uh, with uh, the services that are going on there, and it's, an, it's one of our challenges moving forward. So out of the York Pocosin office, what we have available there is our 24, 24 hours, seven day a week, 365 day a year emergency services. Um, there are times those services can be provided directly in the building. Sometimes we bring somebody in to provide that, but that service is available at the York Pocosin office. We do have a range of outpatient uh, services, we tend to think of as counseling, uh, both individual and group for mental health, substance use, geriatrics, children and adults. Uh, adult and child psychiatry, uh, we, I should have listed geriatrics on there and I did not, so that is my omission and I, I apologize for that. Mental health skill building is a, is a service that is primarily available uh, to individuals with Medicaid, but not exclusively. Uh, it provides for individuals with serious mental illness. It is a, a program that helps build independent living skills so that a person doesn't have to live in a, in a home or in an assisted living facility or something for the rest of their lives. They can actually go out in many cases, not all, but in many cases can go out and live on their own with some supports, um, get a job, remain employed, all the things that we would, we would want for our lives. Case management, which really links and monitors folks in services and connects people to where they need to go and helps them navigate benefit systems and benefit management uh, programs. Uh, we have those available for pretty much everybody we, we serve as far as populations are concerned. So you'll see that the, uh, what we call IDDD, that's our developmental services that we refer there. Intensive outpatient services is a little difficult to explain. It is somewhere between inpatient and outpatient um, service. I remember growing up when I went to the doctor, uh, I either had to go to the doctor's office or get admitted to the hospital. And then this wonderful thing came along called outpatient surgery, where you could get some things done and you could go home at night. Intensive outpatient services is sort of like that within a continuum of care, that it's not just going for once, once a week counseling, that sort of thing, and it's not being admitted to a hospital, but it is the ability to get multiple hours of therapy in a group setting multiple days a week, and to be able to get that level of care, pretty much the same number of hours of care that you would receive in a residential or in often, often an inpatient setting, but you get to go home at night, and the cost is much lower, and the effectiveness is, uh, is just as high and, off, and, and usually better. Many individuals are able to maintain their jobs and so on while in that, in that service. We out, Colonial operates three of these programs, um, and two of them are located in the York Pocosin office. We have a uh, significant offering for that, that program here. Veterans and active duty military services. We are, uh, Colonial is known as the leader among the 40 community services boards in the, in the Commonwealth uh, in this area. And when people are looking for how should you do this, uh, they tend to contact us. So we are, we are proud about that. We'll talk about that a little more <coughs> later on. And then prevention services where we work uh, providing uh, substance abuse prevention work and some health promotion work in our school systems. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're providing those services, uh, pretty much the same array of services in all of our, all three of the school systems that we, that we, in our, in our service area. 
So feel free to interrupt me with questions as we go along. I'm, I can just flow through this quickly. But. So this next set of services are available through Colonial Behavioral Health, but they are not physically located at the York Picosan office. Um, our residential services, our group homes, uh, are located in York County and one in the city of Williamsburg. <clears throat> um, our ID or DD day support, a really centralized uh, program there, is available, um, well, it's in, the, it's in our Williamsburg campus, Williamsburg office. But we do have uh, the buses. If you look at the, uh, the logo, you'll see the white buses riding through, riding through town that have the, uh, the little logo on the door. Well, that's us coming through. Um, and we do transport, come through and pick up individuals uh, that reside in Pocosin and Lower York County and transport them every day back, <coughs> back and forth where they'll receive uh, support services, but often they, they will go out and do volunteer work. Um, we do have some, some consumers that we, we call them that actually are uh, doing some paid, paid work. Uh, for instance, helping with the landscaping and things with the hospital in Williamsburg, uh, Centeras Hospital up there. Our psychosocial rehabilitation program uh, we call it our clubhouse program named People's Place. It is located in Williamsburg, and we, again, we are running, we run buses, and we do have residents from Pocosin that attend and, and ride, ride these buses uh, every day. And Part C and early intervention services is not provided directly by Colonial. We provide that service uh, through Child Development Resources, or CDR, who we all, we all know. Um, so that, that is not, we are the, the fiscal agent for that. The, the money comes to the state, from the state to us. We pass that through the Part C dollars and so on to CDR. One program we're particularly proud of, and it's been brought up uh, by members of council uh, the last couple of years when we've, when we've come to talk about the performance contract, is our crisis intervention team. We saw a, a uh, CIT program for a few years and finally got some funding for it in 2012. CIT is a program that was created in Memphis, Tennessee uh, by the police department there to intervene differently with individuals that have serious mental illness that law enforcement encounters on the street. And the, the purpose is, number one, to provide law enforcement with different options than they than they had previously around, it was always either jail or hospital, and often it was jail. Uh, because very often, mentally ill, if they're committing crimes, they're often, you know, nuisance crimes, trespassing, or that, that loitering, those, those sorts of things. So the CIT program was there to, number one, train law enforcement in different ways to approach the seriously mentally ill provide them with alternatives to incarceration, uh, to help link people to the treatment that they need, reduce the jail population um, of, for those with serious mental illness, and eventually to be able to create a place where law enforcement could bring someone that has a serious mental illness to t so that they would not even have to take them and hold them in custody for hours and hours. And you, you probably read in the papers, when we have someone that's in a mental health crisis and our staff are trying to find a, a bed, if someone needs a bed and they need to be detained against their will, it can take hours. And often we're calling 15, 20, even up to 25 hospitals trying to find an empty bed. Um, and law enforcement used to have to sit there the entire time because the person was in legal custody and they would just wait. And that's time they're not patrolling. That's time you're paying overtime. <laughs> that's, that's time that's, that's not productive. Well, what we were able to finally, finally achieve in 2014 was funding to create what we now call our crisis intervention team assessment center. And I'll move to that in just a second. But if you look, you find Pocosin has had nine of your officers go through this 40-hour training to teach them how 
to intervene differently with the mentally ill. And, it, and Precocin's been a great partner, a fantastic partner. And were it not for confidentiality, I could bring parents, residents of Pocosin in here tonight whose children, adult children, have encountered the police prior to CIT and after CIT training, and they have tears in their eyes <clears throat> when they say, it went so much smoother. It was a very different response. And the end result ended up being the same, but it was a much more personal experience and supportive and training made all the difference in the world. And that, that is a, a direct benefit. So um, we've won a couple of awards in the few years we've been around. Uh, one year, one of our law enforcement officers was the law enforcement officer of the year. And in 2015, our uh, program coordinator was the co state coordinator of the year. The assessment center, uh, located at Doctors Hospital in Williamsburg, <clears throat> does provide for the opportunity for law enforcement to bring an individual in a mental health crisis to the hospital and if they meet certain criteria, and the criteria is pretty broad, they can actually transfer legal custody to a security officer that's at the hospital. And when they do that, they're doing that with a memorandum of agreement signed between the, the hospital and the, uh, and the locality that officer can go back out on the road and go back out and patrol while this is going on. They may have to come back if transport is needed to another hospital, but there are hours. And you'll see here that every time a law enforcement officer brings someone to our what we call CTAC, we are saving law enforcement about three and a half hours of time that they would have been just sitting. Uh, it's been a very cost-effective program. and. If you see uh, 14, 14 residents served by, uh, from Pocosin in, this, in the last fiscal year, and we had 625 contacts, which made us the fourth busiest CIT assessment center in the state. And this assessment center is open 12 hours a day, whereas most are open 24. It's a very busy, very busy center, which indicates just what the level of need is in, a, in the communities that, that we all live in. I know our time is running short, but one of the areas we're very proud of is our work with veterans, military, active duty military and their families. Uh, one of our staff members approached us a couple of years back uh, who is a veteran and has seen too many of his friends suffering after coming back from deployment and said, we need to do something. Would you let me go talk to this person at, at this base? Would you let me go? And we said yes. And that has, and this, this individual works in the York Picosan office. And out of that, we have grown to where uh, that is where the, it's not colonial behavioral health, it's the model for other CSBs around the state. It's the York Picosan office that's the model for CSBs around the state. Um, so we have military bases, we have uh, veterans contacting us on their own, looking for help, trying to figure out where they, where they can go, and they're contacting this person, which is now our military liaison. We are the only CSB in Virginia with a full-time military liaison. Um, we complete the screenings, coordinate the service, uh, make sure we're, we're there at the public events, um, and you'll see that we've had over 100 direct military referrals uh, to the liaison. We actually have provided some uh, mental health screenings to, uh, to the active duty military, either pre or post deployment. Those are required to be done within the military, but the military is short on providers sometimes. And where there were overflow issues, there have been times that we have actually, uh, in cooperation with the military, helped helped with that. Um, many of those individuals live uh, in Pocosin and their families live in Pocosin. We noticed in the fir very first six months we had a huge increase in the volume of people coming into our office who were uh, insured by TRICARE and it was word of mouth. We haven't advertised this at all except going to a couple of fairs. We're providing, uh, we've actually provided the same CIT training 
to law enforcement, uh, military police on some of the bases around. They're actually joining with our, uh, our civil authorities. Um, it's unusual for the VA to refer to community-based programs, but the Richmond VA Hospital and the, and the Hampton VA Hospital have done so on occasion. And I would uh, offer to you last week, we got our first referral directly from the Pentagon. Um, um, word of mouth has gotten out that this is the place to come um, in this area. So we have had, uh, you see our number of children's uh, referrals that are coming, many of them coming from pediatricians. Uh, of military, mil kids and military families. And we, while we have a number of bases that are right in our area or bordering our area, which we worked with, yeah, we'll go back a couple, of, a couple of slides, we'll actually show you the bases that have contacted us and we have done some work directly with. In fact, I'm going to skip to that slide and uh, we'll come, come back to this one. <coughs> You see the list there, everything from Camp Perry down to the Newport News Shipyard. Um, those um, bases that are outside of our service area, we have not contacted. Uh, we, we don't do that, but uh, they have contacted us because the word of mouth is out. Can, can we help? Is there something we can do to help them? And when we've, when we've been able to do that, we have done so. As a result of that, uh, Colonial is the only community-based provider working with the Commonwealth of Virginia and the, the Federal Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration to develop a strategic plan for how we address the behavioral health needs of our military active duty veterans and their families. Uh, it was an honor to be involved in, in that and to be a part of, be a part of that group. Um, and our time is basically up. I did want to share with you uh, three challenges Virginia has implemented a new ID and DD waiver service or an entire system for managing that program. Uh, the CSBs across Virginia are assuming the lion's share of the work in making that system effective in the community. Um, the second point is related to the first around the single point of entry for the uh, what we call the DD waiver. Uh, which has never been managed through the CSB system, but, but as effective September 1st or Ju July 1st, it is now. Uh, this year is brand new. And the last thing I'll just share is that York Picosan office is completely full. And uh, our board is looking at um, strategies we might use to find a different location, um, do expand. I, I don't really think there's any expansion opportunities on that site, but we've got some challenges with, uh, with locations and so on. So we may be uh, needing to come back and, and, and chat about some of those strategies moving forward. We can do that. Uh, it, it's, I, I'll, I'm fascinated by the, uh, by the multitude of things that you do uh, for the city. You know, it's, it's, there's a lot of times, and you know, people, uh, including myself, uh, sometimes don't really think about mental health mm -hmm. and uh, as much as we should, um, and that it is it's vital. And what you've, what your organization is doing, and I know that that we help. I'm sure that our help is small in comparison to all the partners that you have to do. But I would I would say how much that we appreciate it. And I would also say how thrilled I am that our that our that our Pocosin police have gone through that training. I mean, that one hit me, you know, square that approaching somebody who is in need and is mentally ill is a recipe for disaster unless you have that training. Right. And it's good for both sides. I, I would imagine the police officer feels better as he approaches and he recognizes the signs that you teach them and the work with the military. I, I would tell you that I, I undersold how much time you would need to tell us everything that you do. But I appreciate this briefing wholeheartedly. Uh, we will certainly be uh, talking in the coming months about how to get into a bigger footprint. Understand that. Uh, and the need. We are a growing region and therefore all things have to grow. So just let us know. Council, y'all got any questions?
questions or comments? I've got a question, just curiosity, I guess. If it's a member of the military, two-part question, actually. If it's a member of the military and, and they're being referred to you from the VA, um, and there's no open space at the VA, can they go to a civilian hospital if y'all need them to do that? And conversely, on the other side, if you get somebody to come to the VA and there's no beds, is it out of reach to even talk to the VA if they have open space? I'm just wondering if there's any reciprocation. Reciprocation is difficult. Um, there are, uh, even the VA has instituted new rules now. They call it the, the VA Choice Program, but how to even navigate that is difficult. Um, typically, you have to request VA services, um, schedule an appointment, then have to wait more than 30 days to have it before you can actually try to access other community based care. Um, uh, the VA is working hard to expand their. their work with the community, uh, they've got a ways to go. But I know they're, they're working on it. They're, they're trying. <laughs> Just, uh, uh, you know, last year, I think or the year before, there was that tragic situation where uh, I think it was the state senator's son, uh, uh, they couldn't find a bed for him. Do you ever have trouble finding a place for someone that needs to be committed at that point in time? We have had major problems finding beds. Um, and but never failed to find one eventually. Uh, there were times that it went way past even what the code allowed for you to hold a person. But two years ago now, the General Assembly passed legislation that requires the state hospitals, uh, if you can't find a bed for an individual within eight hours, the state facility is required to take them, no refusal, doesn't matter, uh, what's going on with the individual, they're required to take them. What that has done is it started to create bottlenecks in the state hospital system, and now there's uh, tremendous pressure for us to get people out of the hospital to create the flow through. Thank you, Dave. Hey, appreciate everything. Uh, I'm going to try and set this up maybe on a yearly basis. To be quite honest with you, I think uh, mental health is something that we do need to have on the open panel and discussions. And where do you go for services? And what are those services? I just think it's something that our citizens always need to know. So, uh, I appreciate your time. Right. Thank you for your support. We, uh, you've been great partners with us since 1972. We couldn't do our work without you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll move on to the main session.